Hello everyone and welcome. This is Steve Cefaletto from Erie Community College, just south of Buffalo, New York. Today's presentation is titled Xerography, so I'd like to discuss some of the basic principles of xerography. Xerography means dry writing. So the colorant or the toner powder, that dust is dry. It's not like inkjet, which is a fluid or a liquid. You might remember that graphy means writing, and litho or lithography means stone writing. Photography, photo means light writing. Xerography is often called electrophotographic, or it's abbreviated EP, and that's because we're working with electrostatic or static electricity charges. Most people refer or know xerography or electrophotography as just simply laser printing. And lasers today use light emitting diodes or LEDs. And xerography became very popular back in 1985 when Apple introduced its laser writer laser printer for desktop publishing or DTP. Let's talk a little bit about some history of xerography. In 1938, xerography was invented by Chester Carlson. In 1960, the Xerox company introduced office copy machines. Their speeds back in 1960 were three pages per minute. And in 2011, Xerox, located in Rochester, New York, had sales or revenues of $22 billion. And then in 2017, it was only $10 billion. In 1969, Xerox invented the laser printer. And in 2002, an iGen 3. And then in 2015, they introduced the iGen 5. The iGen 5 was a 14 by 26 sheet size device. It could print on 350 GSM paper. It had 150 pages per minute speed, which is about 9,000 sheets per hour. And the four color version was around three quarters of a million dollars, $750,000. And if you wanted to buy a fifth color, which could be used for opaque white, clear, or spot colors, that was around $850,000. Let's talk about famous brand names. They often become nouns and verbs. When someone says, make me a Xerox, what they're basically saying is, make me a photocopy. Band-Aid for bandages, Kleenex for a facial tissue, Kool-Aid, the sugar drink, Jell-O for the dessert, Scotch tape and adhesive tape, Q-tip for cotton swabs, Walkman for portable cassette tape recorder, player. Aspirin for headache and pain medicine. Google, so when someone says Google this, they're talking about doing an internet search. Post-its, those removable notes. Chapstick, which is a lip balm. Frisbee, which is a flying toy. Popsicle, frozen ice on a stick. Jacuzzi for a hot tub. Photoshop for image editing. And PowerPoint for a presentation software. There are six steps in xerography. Let's discuss each of them in a little bit more detail. This slide gives you an overview. You charge. So the first step is charging. The second step is exposing or imaging. The third step is developing. The fourth step is transferring the image. The fifth step is fusing. And the sixth step is cleaning. And then you re repeat this cycle all over again. So this is the charger, the writing information, the development, the transfer, the fixing or fusing, and the cl drum cleaning. Let's look at these in more detail. So the first step is to charge. So we have this photo conducting drum. It's either a drum or it's a belt. And we charge it with electricity, static electricity, if you will. And the drum is typically called an OPC for organic photo conductor. It has a selenium coating on it. We use electrical wires produce, to produce a corona discharge that ionizes the air. So we often use voltages like 800 volts direct current, DC current, typically a negative charge. And if we vary the voltage, you can make it a more or less attractive. So you can adjust your density or your color by changing your voltage. So if you think about static electricity, if you take a balloon and rub it against your hair, you introduce static electricity into that balloon. Then if you put it up against a wall, you have the balloon held to the wall by static electricity. 
And that image of the woman with her hair frizzing out is an example of a Van de Graaff generator. You often see those at science museums. The second step is called expose. It's often called writing. Light discharges or removes the electrical charge. So in the old days, the photocopiers used mirrors and lenses to do this. Today, with modern copiers, we use LED light emitting diode lasers. Now, the image is latent, which means it's invisible. So it's just like a photographic image. When you click the shutter on a piece of film, that image is latent until you develop it. So the next step, of course, would be development. In development, oppositely charged toner gets attracted to the latent image. So the toner is a dry powder or a dust, and it's very, very small. It's about five microns. And remember that one micron is a millionth of a meter, or one micron is four one hundred thousandths of an inch. Toner is carbon black, which is a pigment. And if it's a color, it would be a ground up plastic. So a typical cartridge might weigh about a thousand grams and it might cost you about a hundred dollars. So the consumable cost of the toner is typically covered by the click charge. Now this is interesting. If you photocopy onto a gloss coated paper, which is very smooth, you can typically feel the height, the relief of the melted dried toner on the paper, especially if it's a rich black. The fourth step is transfer. So here the paper gets the opposite charge, now a positive of the toner, and makes contact. So opposite charges attract, plus and a minus or minus and a plus, and similar charges repel, plus and a plus or a minus and a minus. So in electrophotography, we do have transfer by contact, but I would not call it impact. So it's really kind of like non-impact. It's just a kiss impression, if you will. Inkjet is non-contact. Uh, electrophotography is contact, but it's not impact. Impact would be like letterpress and lithography. With static electricity and sheet fed offset lithography, we don't want any static electricity because that static electricity causes the paper to cling at the feeder and at the delivery, which can cause feeder knockoffs and trip offs and delivery problems. So on the Ryobi 3302 presses that we have, we have two static eliminators, one located at the feeder and one located at the delivery. The fifth step in xerography is fusing. So paper with the toner makes physical contact with a heated Teflon fuser roller, which melts the plastic toner into the paper. So fusing is a combination of pressure, temperature, and dwell time, which is basically speed. Typically, we're looking at 400 degrees Fahrenheit at one half or 0.5 seconds. Of course, this temperature is affected by the caliper thickness and the moisture content of the paper. So the thicker the paper, the more temperature you need, and the thinner the paper, the less temperature you need. So when you first turn on a uh, copy machine, you might have to wait several seconds because you're waiting for that fuser roller to heat up. So once again, fusing is sometimes called fixing. So if you ever get a sheet jam before the toner has been fused or fixed, and you remove that sheet from the machine, it's just a powder sitting on the top of the sheet. You can actually wipe it off with your fingers. You can blow it off. That's because it has not been fused or fixed, which makes it permanent. Uh, the fuser roller is typically a hollow metal tube. It has a heating element or a lamp inside of it. In the old days, we used to put some silicone, silicone oil onto the fuser roller to help prevent the fuser roller from sticking with the toner. But we've typically have eliminated uh, silicone oils from the fusing rollers today. So in newer technology, we have a thin foil belt or a ceramic roller. It heats up very fast, so there's really not, not much waiting or warm-up time. And on our Ricoh Pro C5200S, it is an oilless, uh, and it does use a thin foil belt. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you stack up several dozens or hundreds of sheets in your delivery on a copy machine, you can actually feel the heat inside the paper pile. The sixth and final step of xerography is cleaning. So any excess toner is now removed and cleaned off the photoconducting drum. We can use a rotating brush, kind of like a broom sweeping, or a squeegee wiper blade, or a vacuum. 
So this excess toner goes back into a waste container that you eventually have to remove and empty. We repeat the cycle all over again. Now, the interesting thing about the electrophotography or zoography is, of course, when you repeat the cycle all over again, you can use a different or a variable image. So that's one of the major advantages of digital printing is variable data printing or VDP. Some issues and concerns here. Well, the image is very sensitive to atmospheric environmental conditions of temperature and relative humidity. So if you don't have a temperature and humidity controlled press room, you could expect to have a lot of variability. At low fuser temperatures, the toner does not well bond to the paper surface, so the toner could scratch, rub, flake off, or cause marking. The heat from the fuser dries out the moisture from the paper, making the paper very dry and very brittle. So if you need to fold it, you'll typically get a lot of cracking at the fold, or you'll see the toner cracking at the fold, especially if the toner is a black Many substrates or medias are limited due to their sensitivity to heat. These are things like plastics, films, or maybe even the inks. So you have to use laser compatible inks that don't have a lot of wax in them that would re-soften or remelt under the diffuser. And the six step process relatively is slower than other digital technologies like inkjet. And another concern is the toner is expensive, but so is inkjet. Well, I want to thank you for your participation and involvement in this presentation. I hope you found the content relevant, interesting, and informative, and I hope to see you again. Bye now.